Take a minute to pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, what a privilege it is this morning to have been just considering your Son, our Lord Jesus, and considering him as a willing sacrifice. And we got a glimpse of Moses and uh, shows us uh, what we're like all too often, just that uh, unwillingness uh, to, to answer the things that you have called us to do. But we thank you for our Lord Jesus, who was willing. And we're thankful for um, his, his perfect character and for the righteousness uh, that he showed us. Uh, such a contrast uh, between what we would come up with in our own thinking about what would be moral and right as humans, but what you say is righteous. What a contrast. And in your son, the Lord Jesus, is hidden all the treasures of wisdom. And this morning, as we, as we are going to be looking into the book that has so much to say about wisdom, we pray that we might see our Lord Jesus Christ uh, as, we, as we listen this morning, that we might see those treasures that are hidden in him, in his beautiful person. Uh, so this we pray this morning, just giving you thanks that we can be gathered uh, in, in your name, and uh, we look forward uh, to, to what you will speak to our hearts. And we pray for, uh, for help from your spirit for our brother as he shares now. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. So this morning I've been asked by uh, Ben and A.B. and uh, those working on the speakers committee to uh, open a new study with an introduction to the book of Proverbs. I think you're going to really like the book of Proverbs. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, and you know, you're going to find some symbolism used in Proverbs but it's much easier than what we had in Revelation. You know, we can all handle this. And so uh, I pray that this is a helpful introduction to, uh, to get us started here. Okay, what's the key? This keyboard's a little different than mine. Which is the advanced here? Oh, I have just had the little on. button down there. Okay, yeah. different button. Yeah. Now I, uh, my laptop looks works just a little different. It's an old MacBook. So, what is a proverb? When you think about it, well, I really like Oxford's Dictionary. They they get a pretty decent uh, uh, job of uh, of defining it. it. They call it a short, pithy saying in general use stating a general truth or a piece of advice. In other words, it's something that sticks with us. It resonates with us. It, it, be, it describes uh, uh, where we live. Um, and so I was thinking about how to uh, summarize this, and I ran into this uh, great quote by somebody called named Charles Woods. And I think it really puts Proverbs into perspective. He says, the book of Proverbs is a practical book. And we're glad of that. It's a practical book within the confines of another practical book. Uh, its pages are filled with the lessons of life in the most understandable and applicable form. We're going to get this. So the book tells us how to live and enumerates the consequences of failing to do so. So it's got a carrot and it has a stick. Uh, and both are useful to us. So I think it's time to have a little meet and greet with the author. Uh, Solomon is the author. And I'm going to look at a couple of passages here that give us an insight into his view, worldview and his character. So we start off here in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 24 and 25. And so uh, David comforted his wife Bathsheba 
and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. But notice this next uh, sentence here. And the Lord loved him and sent a message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord, the cause of the Lord. So God knew that the nation of Israel needed King Solomon. And from birth, he was prepared for this ministry. Now, Solomon uh, did what many kings do. He married the daughter of Pharaoh uh, as part of an alliance. And he's, he's concerned about nations wanting their territory, and he's not perfect. He goes and makes uh, an alliance that brings an unbelieving spouse into his house. And this is going to cause him a number of problems later. But there's the upside to Solomon, too. Uh, he uh, built Israel's first temple using his father David's plans. And when we read about how he built his house and he built the temple, he thought very logically, he cared about his people, and he got the job done. So just like us, he had his struggles with sin, and he had his victories. And he was known for his wisdom. And so th this is a book of wisdom literature. So we have an, another example here uh, of Solomon that uh, comes to us from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. That again gives us uh, an eye, uh, a, a view into his character. God asked Solomon what he wanted. And this is Solomon's answer. If you're thinking Jeopardy, it was a good answer. Let's read it here. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? That's a pretty good request to ask from God. And you know what? God immediately uh, lets us know here in verse 10, he says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon uh, had, uh, had asked for this. I mean, he could have asked for a lot of other things, and yet he wanted wisdom and he wanted to serve his people. That's uh, a great characteristic uh, of those because one of the things about wise people is they, they don't have to make the mistakes themselves. They can look at what's going on and they can learn from the mistakes of others. And again, like all of us, Solomon experienced both uh, successes and failures. So one of the things that's going to, where there, we're going to see common ground between the book of Revelation and the book of Proverbs is that they both use metaphors and they both personify ideas. Now, up here you see uh, a statue that's from Frankfurt. You know, the U.S. has Lady Liberty uh, in uh, New York Harbor. Well, uh, France had given us Lady Liberty. Well, this is uh, Justia in Frankfurt, Germany. And in this case, she is justice personified. And, you know, most Western democracies understand this. We all tend to think this way. But I want you to look closely at the picture. Note how she is holding a scale in one, in one hand and a sword in the other. You know, think about what she's trying to do. Uh, she's trying to decide what is true, what is false, and to make sure when there is evil that justice will punish that, and when there is something that's good, uh, justice will promote that. And so this makes sense to us here, and what we're going to see 
in Proverbs is that Solomon is going to uh, do the same kind of thing. He's going to personify uh, uh, people. Uh, one that you're going to see, uh, I, I have a whole cast of characters for you later, but I want to mention two now. Uh, one you're going to see in Proverbs is wisdom. She'll be personified. And wisdom is somebody you want to get to know. And then there is the other end of the spectrum, the fool. And Proverbs has a lot to say about both of these characters and many others. And we'll, we'll look at a whole cast of characters uh, later on. But again, I want you to, to uh, as, you, as you wrestle with this book, I want you to sort of follow these themes and uh, you will get great wisdom out of it. So let's let Solomon speak for, him, for himself. Let's look at his introduction. Uh, and he begins in the first verse, uh, uh, the, whoever compiled, ultimately compiled, compiled the book later on uh, gives us an introduction uh, in verse one, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So Solomon is in charge of the book, and there's evidence that he, he found other Proverbs that he liked and he included. I mean, good writers like good material. And so, but look at what his objective was. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand the words of insight, that's good. To receive instruction in wise dealing, who doesn't want that? Um, but also he wants that in righteousness, justice and equity you know the social justice warriors would take a great uh should be able to get great insight by focusing on these statements this is what justice looks like but he wants more he wants more you know like Bill, the pitcher uh pitcher billy mays that he did all the commercials but wait there's more uh and here he wants more he says he wants to give prudence to the simple and knowledge and discretion to the youth. In other words, he wants wisdom to come in at an early age. So let's continue and, and hear him out here. Uh, he, he says, let the wise hear and increase in learning and the one who understands obtain guidance. What for? To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. And then he, he ends this section with a focus on the key point here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's what we know. But then, so that's the, that's the, the pitch. And then here is the contrast. Fools. We're going to meet, you know, we're going to meet these characters again, but we're going to, fools despise wisdom and instruction. How many of you heard of the school of hard knocks? You know, we've all heard of that. And uh, I still remember the joke about the old farmer who uh, needed to get his uh, mule moving and he would whack him up against the head and the mule would get the idea to move. Now, we don't want God to have to get our attention in that same way. We want to listen to Solomon. So I want you to notice how he has drawn a con uh, contrast between the wise who listen and learn and the fools uh, that don't. So Let's move on, talk about, this is the cast of characters. And these are the people I want you to watch for as you deal with the book. And again, we're all gonna get out of this book what we put into it. The more we interact with Solomon, uh, the more we'll, the, the better our view will be and it'll help us uh, navigate these very difficult days that we're in now. So we've got this wonderful cast of characters. And I've given you some really short definitions so you can watch for them. So the first one is the wise. And the, the key there is they tend to listen to God. The second one is the fool. Notice he's the contrast here. And he despises God's 
uh, wisdom and instruction. He, you know, if there was a singer, it would be Frank Sinatra. He'd borrow Frank Sinatra's uh, uh, song, I Did It My Way, and he would not be happy that he did. And then you have the simple. They are double-minded and undisciplined. In, in other words, they, they kind of go with the flow without thinking it through. Uh, and that's not a good place to be either. And you have those, you, you have the, the, the previous two contrasted with um, three characters that sort of work together, the righteous, the wise, and the prudent. And what, Karen, uh, what uh, characterizes these three is that they listen, they observe, and they learn. So now we get to the bad side. Uh, we have the, the bad uh, contrast. The wicked, we, we run into that in uh, chapter 2 and verse 22, and they reject God's covenants and ideas. God has a plan for us, and they are the stiff neck that don't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, there, the, there is one who takes it to a, yet another level, the scoffer. We run into him in twenty-one and uh, uh, chapter uh, twenty-one and verse twelve, and he's the real cynic. He looks at what's going on. He he has the um, the ability to understand and listen and learn, and he just stands back and does uh, Nelson out of the Simpsons. Ha uh ha! -huh. Uh, no, we re we really don't want to be this guy. But he's still not the apex of the bad guy. There's one that's worse. Uh, the, we run into this one, the one who is wise in his own eyes, in Proverbs 26 and verse uh, 12. And this one's almost hopeless. I mean, the Lord can reach in and, and transform the most rabid enemy. The Apostle Paul is a great example of that. Uh, and by the way, if you if you want to watch a good Christian movie, there is a uh, uh, a movie that uh, Jim Caviezel was part of called Paul the Apostle, and it's uh, very well done. Uh, about uh, and it shows the change between Saul and Paul. So. Paul was almost to that point, but the Lord, and he may, he may have even been, but the Lord intervened. And then finally, we have the last of the characters, uh, the adulterous woman. And I would remind people that it takes two to tango. So uh, the victim of the adulterous woman uh, bears, the, uh, bears the sin of, of that choice as, as well. So these are the characters that we're going to meet. And so I want to try and talk about it in terms of choices. If you look at Proverbs chapter 19, 3, it says, When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. This means the person described here has rejected the Lord, made a bad decision, and their life is in shambles. And what do they do? Do they say, I sinned, I repent? No. They blame God. God, it's your fault, not mine. Uh, sorry, uh, that doesn't work. And so just to uh, think about how one might start to get into this, I, I was thinking about a cartoon that I saw back uh, about a year ago uh, in the comic strip, For Better or For Worse. And the oldest son, um, teenage son, had a little issue with work ethic. He was like many. And uh, he procrastinated. And so what he did is he decided uh, he needed to do his homework. And he had procrastinated so much, the question was, could he get it done on the school on the school bus on the way to school. Now, 
Eileen and Beth are both teachers and they will tell you that is not a good way to learn. Uh, again, we have to own our choices. Now, I mentioned one of the characters that I think is really important and that is the fool. Now, I grew up in the 1980s and I remember this actor and his tagline. And actually, believe it or not, he's, he's a believer. And what I found interesting was that he was pushing this message to kids. He did a lot of work with kids outside of his acting career. And he was saying, I pity the fool. And he was, saying, he was trying to encourage them to make good choices. And so we have to realize that the uh, fool is probably the central bad character in, in uh, Proverbs. And uh, uh, some, someone once said that you, can, you can't make anything foolproof because fools are so ingenious. They always find ways uh, to uh, mess it up. But we need to pray for fools because all of us were fools at one point when we rejected Christ. And so what we want to pray is that the, that the Spirit of God would draw the fool to Christ and would then transform him into one who reads and understands the scriptures and is able to share them with others. And we also have to realize we were all fools at one time too. And Christ wants us to listen and obey his commandments. And when we do that, he transforms us into the wise. So I was thinking about what is the role of parents, especially here in the church, uh, to sort of help bring their children along and teach them. And I was, I was drawn to the words of the Apostle Paul in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. He said, he, he's talking to children and he's talking to parents about this difficult time that, uh, that the uh, raising of children is for both parties. And he says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Now, I was actually kind of interested in this because I looked at the word that Paul uses there. It's uh, erephazo, and it's like poking somebody with a stick. And, you know, when you get to that point and with, that you're poking with a stick and the, the conversation isn't going well, there's no transfer of learning. And so, you know, the thing is, as, as parents, we're supposed to be the adults in the room. And so we have to watch that, uh, that we don't uh, let our, our uh, exasperation get in the way of, uh, of uh, correcting our children. So let's go again, go back and look at what Proverbs, how uh, the, Solomon wrote this in Proverbs. Verse 5, notice he says, let the wise hear and increase in learning. That's the goal. And let the one who understands obtain guidance. He goes on and he says, to understand the proverb in its sayings and the words of the wise in their riddles. That means not everything is going to be straightforward. We have to uh, think about it. And that's something I, I know in my quiet times, uh, I have to spend a lot of time thinking about how what one passage is, uh, is saying compared to another and, and trying to uh, bridge that gap, gap of language and century and uh, culture uh, between the, the biblical writers. And, and that takes work. And again, the fool isn't going to put that work in. So he goes on and he says, he gets to the point here. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, if, if we fear God, that's a good start. We have still have work to do. Beginning of wisdom, he says, fools, and uh, beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
So when we are, are sort of pushing back against what we know the scriptures want us to do and what our parents want us to do and uh, our teachers who are trying to, uh, to help mold us into uh, functional adults are trying to teach us to do, we need to sort of step back and think and realize that the contrast is fools despise wisdom and instruction which means they become losers because they don't get the benefits of the gift. If you don't take a gift, you don't, you don't get the benefits. So that brings us to an end here. Uh, and as we close, I want to leave you with three points here. First is Solomon is a great writer. He makes his points clearly. He uses examples that resonate with us. We can understand this message. The second piece here is that he uses repetition to help us. You have to realize that during most of human history, people didn't have copies of the scriptures. They had to memorize them. And if you want, it, if you want to make something memorable, you make it where it rhymes and, and uh, use words that resonate. And it's all designed to get it from the eyes and into the heart. And that's, that's where we want to be. Uh, and so, uh, again, parallel statements are one way that they do that. That sort of is a comparison and contrast. But then finally, the last point is, Lord, the Lord Jesus didn't leave us here alone. He had the Father send us the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit's job is to guide us into all truth. So the point here is, as, as an assembly, as we go through Proverbs over these next weeks, we need to be in them and thinking about what the, the writer, uh, what uh, Solomon uh, was saying in, in the chapter for the week and how it might fit into our lives individually and corporately. And and thing is, you can't lose if you do that. The Lord will change us. And so we have a wonderful opportunity before us. And I want to leave you here charged up to want to go do that. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you gave us Solomon's wisdom, the book of Proverbs. We thank you that he writes as clearly as he does. We thank you that his ideas uh, go across cultures. All of us can understand these. And we thank you most of all because the one who shows us what perfection looks like, our Lord Jesus Christ, lay down his life for us. And indeed, he has promised his Holy Spirit in our hearts to aid us to do this. So, Father, we just pray that you would work in all our hearts, um, and we pray that we see the fruit of the Spirit uh, here at Northgate because of the, of the book of Proverbs. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.